Yali Madhid, everyone. I will now introduce Dr. Alnur Abdullah. He has achieved a lot, but I will mention a few. Dr. Abdullah, the cardiologist, was born in Tanzania. He received his MD degree from the University of British Columbia in 1975. The residency in internal medicine was completed at UBC. His fellowship training in cardiology was at the University of California. Dr. Abdullah is board certified and has fellowships in internal medicine, cardiology, and interventional cardiology, both in Canada and USA. He has practiced cardiology for three decades and has provided healthcare in Canada USA, Pakistan, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. He also has made academic appointments to some of the world's prestige universities, including the Aga Khan University. He was recruited by the Aga Khan University to be the first head of the treasury cardiology program, which he established between 1994 and 1998. He then assisted the development of the AKU East African Cardiac Program in Kenya. He has won dozens of awards and honors in the medical field in the community at large, some of which include the Heart and Stroke Foundation Award for the Outstanding Service, Canadian Smiley High Achievers Award for Professional Development, Aga Khan Silver Jubilee Silver Medal, the Governor General of Canada 125th Anniversary Medal for Service to Canada, and the Nehru Humanitarian Award for UBC GOEL Foundation. Dr. Abdullah has now retired from clinical practice, but is active in cardiovascular education and consulting for com complex cardiac problems in Canada and internationally. Thank you. Let's relax and enjoy the session. Dr. Abdullah, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Nimi. That was a very generous and a kind introduction. Uh, um, I was just wondering as you were giving this introduction, were you really talking about me? Anyway, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to try and share my screen. And... Um, <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> I want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about uh, women and heart health. And I have been thinking, what should I talk to you about? And then I say to myself, is it the heart that I'm talking about or is it the brain? So that's the interface. That's the thought in my mind, all right? Okay, so February, as Nassim said, is Heart Month. It started in the United States, but now is spreading all across the world that February is becoming a Heart Month. We raise the awareness of heart disease, which is the number one uh, cause of death for people all over the world and also in the developing world. And it is increasing in incidence. And um, this is the month that we try and raise awareness about it. And we um, try and educate people about heart disease and talk about prevention measures of what you can do to prevent uh, having a, a heart problems or a heart attack. So it's a, it's a perfect month to, to do this talk. So on the first Friday of this uh, month, and this time it fell fell on the 5th of February, we call it Go Red Day for Women. This is a day that is specially designated in the Heart Month for women and the need to bring awareness that in women as well, uh, heart disease is the number one cause of death. By far, it is more common than all the cancers put together and way more common than breast cancer. Now those diseases are very important and we need to deal with them, 
but I'm just saying that the likelihood of uh, a woman having a major problem is more than likely going to be cardiac. So on the you know first Friday of every month, we designate that day as the go red day to focus this issue on women. And we all wear red on that day. And um, and I'm glad that uh, Nimi is wearing red and some of the other people are wearing red. And on the 5th of um, February, I wore red as well. And I posted this picture uh, on, on, on LinkedIn. All right. So <clears throat> it is also the month where we have Valentine's Day. And Valentine's Day somehow is about love, affection, caring, uh, you know, relationships. And, and it's, it's somehow attaches the emotion of love and feelings and, and caring to the heart. So somehow we associate Valentine's Day with the heart and love. But you know, sometimes um, people are unfortunate. Um, they, they have a rejection, they have a, a separation, they have a, a, a problem with a relationship and, and they suffer emotionally. And um, then we say, well, they, you know, they have a broken heart or she has a broken heart. Um, so is this real? I mean, is it, is it really that someone has a, has, a, has a broken heart? You know, I was in Kane the other day and, uh, you know, Mumtaz and, uh, and Nilufar were chit-chatting. I was two meters away, letting you know that. And, and you know, Nilufar was asking Mumtaz about her sister who had had a problem with her relationship and was feeling terrible and was down. And so Mumtaz says to, um, to Nilufar, I'll say it in, in our language and then I'll, I will translate. He said, Mumta, Nilufar Kuroto Ke Chan, Kuroto Ke Chan, Muji Ben Keto, Laveria Ther. Laveria Ther, which is, you know, malaria. And then when you have love disease, then it is Laveria. Anyway, so, so there is this somehow connection of the heart and love, heart and pain, emotion. Is it really in the heart or what is happening? So let's explore this subject a little further about the broken heart. So I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about this woman who is 55 years old. And, and she had a bad argument with her husband. Her husband uh, suffers from heart disease, uh, suffered from heart disease, and he had a previous heart attack and a bypass operation. But you know they had a bad argument, which happens in in all with all couples in all families. Anyway, she gets very upset, terribly upset, storms out of the house and goes for a walk to cool down rather than create any more and uh, acrimony in the house. So she returns about ninety minutes later, and she enters the house and it's quiet. She goes upstairs. And, and goes into the bathroom and, oh my God, he's lying there collapsed on the floor. And she is in such a shock. She starts screaming. She doesn't know what to do. And in this intense emotional state, she herself starts having severe chest pain. And she's unable to breathe, her heart is racing uh, very rapidly, but she has the presence of mind to call 911 and says that her husband has collapsed. She's not really sure if he's still alive and, and that she's having this severe chest pain. So two ambulances arrive and uh, paramedics work on them and rush them in two ambulances straight to the hospital. All right. When they arrive there, the husband unfortunately has passed away and is dead on arrival. Um, she uh, is assessed by the emergency doctors and she's having this severe chest pain. They take the electrocardiogram, the ECG looks like she's having a heart attack herself and they rush her to the cath lab and geography to see which artery is blocked 
and see if they can open the artery in the heart and, and stop her heart attack. So her 32 year old daughter is notified. She arrives at the hospital and learns that her father has died from a heart attack and that her mother is now in the angiography suite and they think she has a heart attack as well and has a blocked artery and they are trying to, um, to see if they can open out the artery. So this is uh, her cardiogram. And most people, most cardiologists or emergency room physicians will immediately recognize that it shows that the person is having a massive heart attack on the front area of the heart where the main pumping chamber is. So this is what they would be expecting to find. They would be expecting that she has uh, developed blockages in the arteries of her heart, which starts in young age and progresses over the years. Usually it is silent. You don't know that it's happening inside until all of a sudden the clot forms on top of this blockage. So the blockage is there, the clot forms on top of it, and the clot now suddenly, abruptly occludes the artery 100% and the area of the heart muscle, which is supplied by that artery, begins to die, and that damage occurs, and that is called a heart attack. So this is what they were expecting to find, and this is why they took her to the cardiac cath lab to, for angiography. And in, this is not her. This is another patient I did at the Aga Khan University in Pakistan, uh, a relatively young man who came in with a massive heart attack similar to that, on the front area of his heart, did the angiogram quickly, found that the main artery was totally blocked right at the beginning. And I was able to put a wire through there, do an angioplasty and put a stent and reopen that artery completely and stop the heart attack in its process and the patient uh, survived. So this is what they took this lady into the cath lab and geography for. And so about 40 minutes later, the cardiologist comes out, the daughter is sitting in this special waiting room right next to the angiography suite. She's just beside herself and he comes out to talk to her. The, <clears throat> he says, she's going to be all right. I think she's going to be okay. He says, but she has a broken heart. What, she says, broken heart? Yes, he says, she has broken heart syndrome. It is also called Takusubu syndrome. So what is this? Takusubu syndrome, broken heart. When they did her angiogram, this is her angiogram, the arteries were completely normal. The artery on the right was normal. There was not a speck of blockage. The artery on the left sides were completely normal and there was no blockage at all. When they tried to look at the heart muscle and the main pumping chamber and they injected dye in the main pumping chamber, you can see it is totally ballooned out and, and dilated. And when it tries to contract, only the upper part contracts, the other part is just damaged completely and keeps ballooning out. So the other name for this syndrome <clears throat> is called the apical, well, apex of the heart, apical heart ballooning syndrome. So in the normal situation, when the heart contracts, all the areas of the muscle contract simultaneously and the blood is pumped out of the heart. But when you have this apical ballooning heart syndrome or <clears throat> what we call Takusubu syndrome, um, you have this part of the heart that just does not pump, does not function. And so the heart function drops to 30%, 20%, or even down to 10%. And in some cases, the patient actually dies. But this lady had survived. So, <clears throat> so what is this Takosubu syndrome? So in Japan, they eat a lot of seafood, as you know, and they catch octopus which is like squid, and we eat calamari all the time, which is the same thing. And they have these pots that they have 
uh, connected with ropes and they drop these pots into the water at the floor of the ocean or the floor of the sea. And the octopus gets, enters these pots thinking there is food in there or something and gets entangled. The multiple tentacles get entangled and the octopus is trapped in there. So this is what we, what they call an octopus trapping pot. Taco, which is octopus, subo is that pot. So octopus trapping pot. So there was this cardiologist in, um, in Japan, his name was uh, Dr. Sato, and he had a patient with this condition. And he saw the angiogram and saw the heart machine, uh, situation, the damage, and it reminded him of this octopus trapping pot because it, 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 um, it looks somewhat <clears throat> like that. And so the name, the scientific name now in the literature, when he first uh, described this case is called Takosubo syndrome, Takosubo syndrome, octopus trapping pot. So one name is the ballooning heart syndrome. Now we know that it is actually scientifically called uh, Takosubo syndrome. So what is this broken heart syndrome? Why is it called the broken heart syndrome? So like in this lady, what happened was there was a stressful situation. She was intensely overcome by this emotional shock of initially already having a bad state of mind with that argument and having gone out and then her coming home and finding her husband collapsed on the floor. So it was such an intense emotional event that it triggered a particular part of a brain called the limbic system, which is the emotional brain. It is the emotional center of the brain. And this emotional center of the brain became overwhelmingly stimulated. And it reacted in a, such a way that it sent out signals to all the hormone glands and the sympathetic nervous system to release adrenaline into the bloodstream. So this is that hormone that makes your heart race and the arteries contract and the heart pumps so hard. But it was such a flood of hormones that, that is released that it gets to the heart in the circulation and essentially collapses the arteries, constricts them and damages the heart. And you get this damage to the heart muscle, which is the broken heart syndrome. And the reason they call it the broken heart is that there is an emotional event that triggers this potentially fatal heart uh, damage. So <clears throat> you may not be able to read this slide, but I will highlight a few key points on this slide. So the commonest trigger is an emotional trigger of a death of a family member or a, or a partner uh, where, or, or a very close pet. You have a, a pet that you are very close to. And that emotional event triggers this release of the bad hormones from your brain. So it is the brain that starts the problem and you get this uh, heart attack type syndrome, which can be potentially fatal. Um, there are other situations and, you know, again, they deal with emotion, argument with a partner or your know, boyfriend or, or with a family member or, or in, in the case, uh, sometimes a renter and a landlord argument or something like that. And then there are other situations such as somebody has this great fear of public speaking like me and then has to give a talk and is so intentionally intensely nervous and worried. And then if he gets on the stage, gets this stage fright and, and brings on this severe chest pain and ends up with this uh, uh, broken heart syndrome. So those are the type of emotional triggers. There are physical triggers that set it off, but it's not the physical pain or itself, but the emotion it engenders in your brain, which then sets off the emotion center in your brain, which overreacts. And, and sets this thing off. So, <clears throat> you know, during 
COVID, uh, things have been particularly bad. We have been cooked up in the house. Um, you know, the spouses and partners are together all the time that they are not used to being 24 seven together. And, you know, the wife feels tense and the husband is coming in our way all the time. And, and um, it's, it's just a, a bad situation during COVID. And as you can all recognize, you know, that, that's me. I have not shaved uh, during these uh, COVID months. And, and uh, this, uh, uh, you can tell who she is. Anyway, so that's the state that I am living in during COVID, but she is in an emotionally stressed and uh, tense and agitated state already. And it doesn't take much to trigger her off, all right? So what is happening during COVID is that there has been a surge of these cases of broken heart syndrome, particularly in women. And what used to be one or two percent of the patients presenting with a heart attack were um, were um, part, were having this broken heart syndrome. It has the, the incidence has increased over tenfold. This is really the first month, first month of COVID, and you can see the incidence was already rising. And by now, it is almost ten times what it was before before um, the COVID. And it is primarily a problem and a disease of women. But the pattern is changing a little bit. Younger women are getting involved, are getting this syndrome, and males are beginning to get this syndrome. It's not surprising. I mean, you show my you saw my picture in COVID there, you know how I look. We are all become sissy, male, and, and so males are getting this broken heart syndrome. And it usually requires a pre-event state of mind that is already tense, agitated, and stressed that, that sets this whole thing off. All right, so it has multiple names, Takotsubo syndrome, broken heart syndrome, ballooning heart syndrome, uh, and it's a real thing. It's a real broken heart syndrome related to emotional stress. So it is primarily a, a situation that occurs in postmenopausal women uh, or older women, but the pattern through COVID is changing. The frequency of this condition is increasing rapidly. It's impacting younger women, and some men are beginning to get this very syndrome of the broken heart. There has to be an emotional or a physical trigger, but the person already has an underlying psychosocial issue. They're already a tense person. They're socially isolated, they are kind of agitated, they have anxiety, and then this trigger happens and you get this overstimulation of the brain and the bra brain overreacts and there is this massive surge of hormones that circulates into the bloodstream and the patient presents at the emergency or the hospital if she is still alive um, and, and looks like she's having a heart attack. The ECG looks like a heart attack. The blood enzyme blood test show that there is damage to the heart muscle. And usually she's rushed to the uh, cath lab and geography to uh, see if they can open out the artery. But what they find is the damage to the heart muscle uh, and the patient can have a cardiac arrest or heart failure. But the arteries are normal. There are no significant blockages. It's not a cholesterol blockage diet kind of issue problem. It's a problem of the connection between the mind and the body, the brain and the heart. They are connected and they can have a tense and a very intense interaction that can sometimes be potentially fatal. Most of the patients who have this broken heart syndrome uh, recover, thankfully. And they recover almost completely back to normal in a few weeks. Or um, the first case I ever saw was a, was a lady and, um, and I had done the angiogram and the heart was uh, looking like, like uh, Takosubo, like an uh, octopus trap. And, um, and then about two or, two or three weeks later, when I had done her echocardiogram, the heart was completely normal, completely normal. And uh, you know she had recovered. 
The problem is about 5% of people who arrive well, arrive alive at the hospital, still end up dying during that hospital stay, during the angiogram or, or after. So it, it is not a, a minor situation. And the problem is that it can recur. And in the next 10 years, about a quarter of these women will have this happen to them again. So it is very important to, uh, to track that. So what about this mind and body, uh, heart, brain and heart connection? And we have been learning and figuring out that there is a very strong relationship with the state of mind and what happens to your heart and heart disease. So the American Heart Association, which is the most respected heart association in the world, wanted to really look at what is the st state of the art knowledge with regards to psychological health, well-being, and the heart disease. And they reviewed everything that was in the literature uh, and talked to doctors who had experience and put this whole issue together in the state of an art statement. And when the American Heart Association puts out a statement, it's like the gold standard. And last year, they put out this statement uh, about the impact of the psychosocial state to the cardiovascular state. And it's a long paper, and I have condensed it for you. And what they looked at was the relationship between psychosocial factors to see if they provide an increased relative risk of heart disease or heart problems. So when they looked at any type of stress, there was a 27% more likelihood of that person having a, a coronary heart disease or dying from a coronary heart problem, as opposed to someone who is not under stress. So people who are not under stress also get a heart attack or die, but people who are under stress are 27% more likely to die. So it's an odds ratio. It gives you additional risk over and above your other risk factors. And they looked at depression and there's a 30% more likelihood of, of having the problem or dying from it or stroke. You look at social isolation and loneliness, which is a, a big problem uh, for, for a lot of people nowadays and, and has gotten worsened during COVID. Now, there is almost a 1.5 times the risk. The odds ratio is one and a half times of someone who gets it, but someone who is socially isolated gets it one and a half times more likely and is more likely to have a death or, 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 uh, or, <clears throat> or a stroke. Same goes for anxiety, a 47% increased likelihood. Same goes for anger and hostility. There's a, almost a 20% increased likelihood of getting the problem. But if you already have heart disease and you have this problem of anger and hostility, then there's almost a 25% increased chance of you getting a recurrent heart attack or a recurrent event. So the emotion, the state of mind, the psychosocial state, mental illness, mental disease has a huge impact on that person with regards to heart disease, but it also has an impact on the family members and others who interact with that person who has some mental issues. So we know that smoking and you know high blood pressure and all that has, um, has increased risk of heart disease, but now we know that psychosocial stress and not just stress, but psychosocial illnesses like anxiety, depression, loneliness, all have a major increased risk that it gives for developing heart disease or dying from heart disease. Okay, so I'm gonna change gears a little bit, but get back to the same issue. And I'm going to talk to you about a verse that is in the Quran. And the verse says, O mankind, fear your Lord, who created you from one single soul and out of it created its mate. And out of the two spread many men and women. And I'm sure many of you have heard this. 
the Aga Khan when he gave the address at the combined parliament senate session here in Canada quoted this verse and all of us sort of concentrate on the first part of this verse which is the fact that we have all been created from one soul and we are all really brethren <clears throat> and that if we look different or we have different opinions or so that's diversity and we should accept that because we, we really we are all one so I'm going to concentrate on the second part of this verse in the Quran and it talks about your mate the person who is always there with you through times of difficulty through unhappiness through sharing your joys and your victories uh, the one who is constantly there as a support system and then your family and then your community from there and then your nation and then all human beings i want to talk to you about that the second part of this verse in the quran so the harvard university obviously the harvard medical school is very highly regarded and in 1938 they started a study it was called the grant study and it was part of a of a program that was the study of adult development they wanted to see how adult developed through teenage years to young adults to middle age to senior uh, older life and <clears throat> what was it that brought about longevity in some and early death in others and what was it that kept some happy and others unhappy. So it was a study to look at longevity factors and happiness factors. And so they took sophomores, which are second year university students at, Mc at, no, not, <laughs> at uh, Harvard University. And, and there, there were, I think, uh, 200 and some 86 uh, patients that uh, pe uh, people who started on this study. And you may be uh, interested to know that four of these uh, sophomores went on to become uh, uh, senators. One actually served in the cabinet of the US president, and one actually became the president of the United States, John Kennedy. He was part of that study. He was a second year uh, student, uh, university student at, at Harvard. And this, this slide says that when this slide was made, the study has been going on for 75 years. And, uh, and um, <clears throat> now at the present time, the study has gone on for eight years. And they were trying, uh, hoping, and they were thinking of finding all these issues of infection or diet or, or you know, some smoking or was going to be the factors that were going to impact longevity all right so they were shocked and this is uh robert waldinger who is presently heading this uh harvard uh, health study and his wife jennifer stone and one of the first things they found, which was coming through repeatedly, was the issue of relationships. Relationship with your mate, relationship with your family, relationship with your community. It was all about relationships. And one of the, the factors they, that they were able to show in, in terms of real data is that those couples who in their middle age, in their 50s or around middle age, had a good, healthy, happy relationship, were the ones who actually lived the longest. It was impacting longevity and were having a happy longevity. They were living happily into their 80s. So something that happens during our life emotionally and with our relationships has an extremely strong bearing on longevity and happiness. So in this study, they thought that, you know, there were, nobody thought that empathy and attachment to your spouse and things were going to be the key factors. And they began to see this connection 
relationships, relationships. It was a surprising finding of this study and they were even more surprised to see how powerful this, this issue was to the long life and the happy, healthy long life down the road. So <clears throat> taking care of your body is important, but taking care of your emotional health, of your mental health, of your relationships is equally happy, uh, equally important. So the next thing they found was that these relationships are not important, are they important with your mate, but they are very important with your community as well, with others and, and in your groups and in your society, in your nation. And the second thing they found was about happiness. Those people, male or women, connected or not connected, mates or not, but those people who were generally happy, lived longer and lived healthier lives. So there was something about this emotion of happiness in the brain that did not allow the brain to put out these noxious chemicals and endorphins and, and hormones that damage the arteries and damage the heart. So there was this safety factor that happiness brings to your heart. The happiness of your mind protects the health of your heart. All right? So remember this point. Happiness is like a protection for the heart. And then on the other hand, loneliness uh, is equally as bad or social isolation as smoking is to the heart or alcoholism is to your health. So it is a strong factor negatively and also positively. So I'll talk to you about the Aga Khan again. Those of you who are Ismailis, we call him Hazar Imam. During his uh, golden jubilee, he gave a sermon and, um, and he said to all of us, his followers, uh, in that sermon in Lisbon, he said, my Jamaat, which is my congregation, my people, uh, will be watching the Olympic Games. This was 2008. What will happen if the winner of the 100 meters men's sprint gets up and instead of saying bravo steroids, he gets up and says bravo broccoli. And he says, this simply comes back to the fact that Islam is also a faith of happiness. Oh, we can laugh. And I like to laugh with my Ijama. So. What is the interpretation? This is my interpretation. Everybody can have their own. And he's contrasting two issues that you can win. You can win in life. You can achieve something in life in a bad way by using steroids and winning the race, by using unfair advantage or cheating. But you can become extremely strong and healthy by eating good food and healthy veg vegetables and broccoli is the symbol of that. And then you can win and that win is a real win. You have won, your body has won that race, not the steroids that helped you win. So he's contrasting a win, which would normally give you happiness, but is that win really your winning or is it really a cheating? of some kind. So he's contrasting this win between steroids and broccoli, and he's trying to engender this sense, thought process about happiness from winning. And I bet you, if you won fair and clean, that happiness is going to be intense and real and authentic. So then he goes on in that same Farman to say, I think my Jamaat very often gets together and you will have dandia ras. You know, we play the stick dance and the ras and the music and stuff. And you will have all sorts of things such as samosas and biryani. I hope no broccoli turns up. And every time you see that ugly vegetable, laugh. What is he saying here? What is the interpretation? We are going to be happy. It's a happy event. 
It's his golden jubilee. We are all congregating here for this final event. And we are going to be having dandiaras, dancing. We are going to be eating samosas and biryani. But we know that normally we consider these things bad for your heart and the arteries and they cause blockages. But he says, enjoy it. Hope no broccoli turns up. And if, you know, when you think of that, just laugh about it. What he's trying to tell you is the protection you get from being with your family, your congregation, your people, and dancing and being happy and eating something that makes you feel good. That happiness provides you protection for the heart. And that samosa and that biryani is never going to hurt you. So he's explaining the issue of the emotional mind playing such a strong role in your heart health. Okay, so uh, let's get back to, to women. And you know, when we talk about premature atherosclerotic heart disease or blockages in the arteries, um, what do we mean by premature? So when men and women get heart disease or blockages under the age of 55, we then call it premature heart disease because you know when people get old they get these heart trouble but when they are relatively young and they get this heart problem then we call this premature heart disease and then they looked at women who get premature heart disease versus men who get premature heart disease they found that 73% more women reported being depressed compared to men so there was this Depression that went along with women developing premature heart disease, whether it was a cause or a risk factor or the fact that they had this heart disease made them depressed. I think it works both ways. So we are now beginning to understand a bilateral relationship between heart disease, which makes you depressed, or being depressed, which produces heart disease. So there is this tight connection between the brain, your mental status, and your heart health. So what about this reverse connection? So now we're looking at people who have heart disease and see what happens to their brain function. So we're looking the other way. And <clears throat> here's this study which was published. And this is men and women. So when they looked at men who had heart disease and then followed their brain function and followed them for many years to see their cognitive function, you know, their thinking ability, their reasoning, their judgment, which is what we call cognitive memory. Uh, so if you have worsening of all that, then it leads to dementia, a type of dementia or, or, or that. So when you look at the women who have heart disease, they tend to have more cognitive dysfunction they have more development of dementia. They worsen their memory. Their reasoning is worse. So there is this connection of heart disease and the female brain, which is a little different. Just like the female brain with the emotional trigger gets more of the broken heart syndrome. So is there a difference between the female brain and the male brain? And yes, you know, I'm in the female brain as a, as, <clears throat> as a shopping part in the brain and chocolates and roses and a gossip center and, and a lot of emotion and love fantasies and sitcoms and Netflix series. And, and the male brain is different. It's uh, predominantly, um, you know, occupied by sex and beer and uh, sports and, uh, and things like that. Uh, so... I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. But the female brain and the male brain is different. So when you look at the brain, you can divide it into two parts. There is what we call the emotional brain and the thinking brain. The, the thinking brain is the rational thinking. It's logical. It's slow. It goes stepwise. It comes to a conclusion. It does that. It it, it goes ahead and conducts the task and things go well and remembers and memory and stuff like that. The emotional brain is rapid. It's a reaction. You just react without thinking. You're not using your thinking brain. You're not stopping to think. You're not taking a pose. You're just reacting. 
immediately. It's so powerful. It's so rapid. It is irrational. It is emotional and, and causes this, uh, this disastrous uh, problem. So women have a higher and a more developed emotional brain compared to men. They also have an excellent thinking brain, so don't take me wrong, but their emotional brain, the limbic system is far more developed and they have much better emotional sensitivity. And therefore the relationship between the brain, emotions and the heart is much more pronounced in women than in men. So the emotions and feelings and things in the brain that are negative will negatively impact the heart and cause heart disease or death. And if you have heart disease, you will get more depression or, or, or anxiety and stress. So there is this connection uh, between the brain and the heart. So what do I teach people? What, how do I help people to make some practical decisions? So I have over the years used this thing of happiness index one to 10 and relationship index, which I call one to 10. Just like, you know, you're going to, uh, somebody's going to ask you about this talk, uh, you know, tomorrow or something. And he says, well, it was a, it was a two. You know, it wasn't much of a talk. Or somebody may say, whoa, it was a 10. I learned so much. So it's this one to 10 scale. And it's easy. It's intuitively. We can all do it. So it's, it's, it's somebody, everybody can do it. And on the happiness scale of zero to 10, on the worst part is being bitter. It's being negative. It's being complaining. It's looking at the glass half full. It's not taking responsibility for what goes on. Always blaming someone. Always acting like the victim, the victim symbol. That is not going to make you happy. It is guaranteed going to drop your happiness scale towards zero. And on the other end of the scale is this emotion of gratitude, of love. If you are grateful for something, you're not going to complain. I mean, if you're grateful for hearing this talk and learning about it, you're not going to complain that I went five minutes over time. But if you're going to be complaining about five minutes over time that I have gone, you are not grateful for all the information and effort I have put into to give you this lecture. And love, emotion is connected to happiness. We all know that. So you take responsibility for whatever happens. Accept it. Deal with it. Know when to let go of an issue and just get on with it. Because it's not, everything is not life or death. It's, it's about letting go. So that's what I teach in the happiness index. And then on the relationship index, zero obviously is loneliness, social isolation. It's about having no friends. It's about being gossipy about everyone and breaking relationships. You know, everyone has their positives and negatives. So if somebody said something that hurt your feelings or this or that, you're not going to go ahead and break that relationship. I mean, there are so many things good about that person. That's why you became friends or you became related or you became connected to that person. Remember those things. Whenever somebody pisses you off about something or the other, remember all the other things about that person that are so good. And you like to go to a movie with her or you, you guys have fun together when, when you are together. So it's about that issue of, <clears throat> of developing relationships and being close to that. So in that regard, I will remind you of a, of a quote by the previous Aga Khan, which is in, in his memoirs that he wrote. And he says, never forget this. The society in which we live cannot give a man happiness. Society can give a man space to breathe and freedom to move in it. It can afford him the means of keeping himself healthy and making himself strong. But happiness, happiness never depends on one's surroundings. It is how you react, your state of mind, how you function. It depends altogether and exclusively on oneself. Everybody has negative stimuli hitting them. Everybody doesn't become unhappy. 
it is your responsibility. Stop being a victim, accept responsibility, and learn to live together as, as, uh, as friends and as uh, happy men and women. So the final slide is about stress. Stress uh, with that occurs at work. If you are a boss at work, or if you are a union worker or something, you usually don't have stress at work. You can make your own decisions, you can do things, or you don't really care about the company, you just go to work and come home. But the middle management is impacted by stress at work. It's peer pressure, everybody's competing, you have to meet uh, deadlines, you don't get paid overtime, you just have to work and get things done. That stress at work is a bad stress. And, and, and to relieve stress, one of the most important things that you can do is physically is to have, be active. And when I talk about activity, I talk about activity in relationship to the state of your mind. This is why yoga is so good. There is physical activity, but there is also peace and settling of the mind and silencing the mind. So that combination of activity and silencing the mind is the key to relieving stress. I mean, you can exercise on a Peloton bike and you know, you are looking at your emails and you are configuring your work issues or you're watching TV or you're in the gym with multiple people or you're going doing activity and exercise walking 8,000 steps, but you go from one shopping mall to another place and then for Starbucks, your mind is active. It's overactive. That activity cannot relieve your stress. You want activity that settles your mind. Going for a walk in nature, hearing that sound of the running water in the stream as you walk in the path in the park, that is the key to relieving stress. So it's about silencing your mind. And in the extreme state, it's meditation um, uh, or, or uh, learning to control your mind, control your thoughts, and be in the moment. So now you're listening to this talk. Stop thinking about the 20 other things that you have to do later uh, because it's going to worsen your experience during this talk. And same when you go for a walk, silence your mind, be close to nature, be in the moment. Don't be thinking and be involved with all the issues that are going to happen when you get home or before water. It's learning, it's an active process, learning to silence your mind. Sleep is another critical issue for stress relief. You need at least seven hours of sleep. So you go to bed at midnight, you get up at seven in the morning, and so you have had seven hours sleep. Worse is, if you go to bed at 10 o'clock at night, and you get up at eight in, at five in the morning. That sleep is restful sleep. It prepares you for the day. You get up in the morning when the diurnal pattern of your nervous system and your hormones is also waking up simultaneously at around five in the morning or six. And then you are ready for the day. There is balance, there is harmony between your chemical state of your mind and your hormones and your activity of waking up. So early to bed, early to rise, and being a social animal. Just do not be a recluse. Have relationships, have relationships, have relationships. Don't break relationships. So what I try to do is every week, I try to call somebody that used to be my friend, or I used to do things with someone, or I used to work with someone or the other, but have not connected with for a long time. I try to reconnect that relationship, particularly if there was a little bit of an unpleasant situation, which is why we stopped to kind of being together or going out with them. Then I make an extra effort to do that. Mend your relationships. You will feel good. It's a generous form of having a mindset, being generous to people, being forgiving, being accepting of people's down uh, mistakes or, or uh, uh, deficiencies because you have as many or probably more. And learn to gauge yourself with the happiness index, 
in the relationship index on a regular basis. Make it a regular state of your mind and learn to be grateful and learn to love. And if you do that, you're going to live long, you're going to enjoy that life, and you're going to be happy. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm sorry if I went over time, but I think it was uh, 50 minutes, uh, Arif, uh, because of the introduction part of the first 10 minutes. And I thank you all for listening to me and um, in giving thought to some of my own original ideas. Thank you. Thank you.